Hey, it's Alex Williams, the new stack here in Tokyo for OpenStack. And I'm on the uh, call, I'm on a call here with a Kelsey Hightower. And Kelsey is in Amsterdam. And Kelsey's there for the OSCON event. And we uh, actually had uh, lunch yesterday in Portland. So we've gone to different sides of the world and are now having a conversation uh, about actually a, a, a briefing event that Kelsey uh, participated in uh, with Intel. I was curious about that. Kelsey was kind enough to participate there on our behalf, and and I was wanting to get a debriefing from Kelsey, and also kind of use that kind of a, for a, for a context and discussion about OpenStack here because we're seeing a lot of different changes within OpenStack. Adrian Cockcroft said to me that it's like uh, OpenStack is now being used. Um, instead of uh, enterprise now, when people are going to sell into big companies, they're selling uh, open stack to enterprise. There's a lot there as well in terms of like introduction of Kubernetes and and kind of the uh, advent of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So that long preamble, uh, Kelsey, great to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me, Alex. Always a pleasure. Great. So, okay, so tell me what you kind of were thinking of some of the main themes that you saw come out of that uh, of that briefing event, and, and maybe you could just give us a little background on about you know what that event was all about. Cool. So you know, I guess by trade, I'm I'm traditionally maybe not an analyst, but um, the event was awesome. It was kind of geared towards uh, industry experts and people who do analyze what's on the roadmap for you know companies like Intel. So it was my first event where I sat in a a series of presentations from a lot of the people working on the core technologies at Intel and what their vision is from the future, of course, around the Intel product offerings. And it was a very interesting event, and I guess we'll dive into some of the detail, but it was the first time I've ever heard of a chip designed um, from a product perspective where you have this core, you have this set of instruction sets, and the way you produce what the market sees is based on customer feedback. So that was kind of the theme of the Intel event, and also it hinged on this one kind of word around cloud, not public cloud or private cloud, but just cloud for everyone. Cloud for everyone. So what, do you, what is the context for that? Is it cloud for everyone, meaning, you know, the democratization, so to speak, of the capability to do on any infrastructure what you might be able to do on Amazon, for example? That's right. And I, and I think what Intel has been doing over the years, and, you know, they did a really good job of summing it all up. You know, between their investment in open source, whether that's Linux kernel work or the contributions they've made to projects like Docker, Rocket, uh, Kubernetes, and OpenStack, there's this idea that you as a customer will have choice between someone hosting some hardware for you or you deciding to run your own hardware. But it's not really just all about hardware. It's about the things that you can do with that hardware. So the idea here is that, you know, what the cloud really is, and this is kind of a bit of my opinion as well, is that it's a set of APIs for accomplishing the things you want to do uh, with the underlying compute. And Intel sees a real opportunity here to allow everyone to have this capability, whether you're a cloud provide, provider, the big three, Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft, or you happen to be running your own data centers, you kind of want the same the same capabilities um, from the things that you will provide your own internal customers. How does that reflect on kind of what they're trying to do as far as being, uh, you know, more interested in, you know, container technologies? So I think when OpenStack came out, right? So if we rewind the clock back, OpenStack came out and it was basically almost this photocopy of what ET2 was at that particular moment in time. And since then, that world has evolved. Even Amazon now has their own container service, whether it's ECS and their container registry. And OpenStack also needs to continue to evolve. So I think when OpenStack started, its goals were to provide an EC2 like environment um, for anyone, anywhere. But also, EC2 has evolved, right? The whole AWS platform has grown significantly over time. And it, I think it's safe to say that OpenStack hasn't kept up with that, right? You know, AWS has their own vision for what the cloud will be. There's going to be a combination of IaaS, infrastructure as a service, and a bunch of SaaS offerings around that. So I think what Intel has the ability to do, the scale of the community, is to provide new advancements of 
what we're starting to see trend in infrastructure, which is containers, cluster management tools like Mesos um, and Kubernetes. And they're going to do a lot of work to help educate people and also contribute code where necessary to make sure that everyone that wants to run a cloud-like environment has the ability to do so. Mm -hmm. So where does this clear container story fit in? And maybe you could just help us understand what that is. So Clear Containers was a really kind of clever move by Intel, right? So you see a lot of demand for the usage of containers. And then right when we saw that spike, we saw that that usage wanted to replace virtual machines. And in some cases it can, but there's one sticking point, and really it comes around multi-tenancy. So if you're running your own servers, you have, you have less worry about you know someone else running an application side by side that would be maybe doing something malicious, right? You still want to be careful about the software you run, but when it comes to true multi-tenancy, that means you're going to have to be able to support arbitrary workloads um, from outsiders. And in that case, the security needs to be where we've reached with virtual machines. You know, even though that's not 100% secure, there is a pretty solid story around that as proven by most cloud providers. So what Quick Container does, it takes, um, you know, the container technology, and wraps it up in currently one of the implementations I've seen is Intel has done some work to allow you to boot basically a specialized, you know, Linux distro, if you will, that can run, you know, let's say a Docker image in a container, boot pretty fast to kind of cut, out, cut down on some of the overhead that you would see from booting a normal virtual machine. And they use this concept to call it clear containers, right? Because Intel has done a lot of work with VXT extensions in the chip to provide some of the security bound, uh, boundaries and performance that we're used to. So, you know, what they've done is they've taken their engineers and created this world where containers run inside these specialized VMs and immediately take advantage of all the advances in virtual machines that we have and leverage the Intel, you know, VXT extensions to kind of make that happen and be performant. Okay. So, with that, uh, you know, with that, that clear container technology, one of the, I mean, is this supposed to kind of help overcome the issue that we have currently with, you know, with, with container management and, you know, the one host problem that you have, you know, primarily the way people have been using containers is, you know, developers just, you know, just playing around with it on a desk, you know, on their, on their laptop. Uh, but as we well know, when it comes down to like trying to, work across multiple hosts, then the, the problem becomes more complex. Does Clear Container help solve any of those problems that we're starting to see crop up? Um, I think so. I think that's kind of a yes and no. I, I yeah. think, you know, if you do have a good virtual machine management platform around KVM, which is the primary implementation of Clear Containers, then, yeah, you basically get to continue to use your, you know, cross-host networking solutions, your store solutions, and allow Docker containers to be kind of married into that world. But I kind of really see that as a temporary solution, right? I kind of see this as, you know, how do we take the new world and integrate it with the old world to allow people to kind of keep doing what they're doing, especially the way people are packaging containers today, where in many cases, you'll see almost an entire operating system inside of, of these containers. So it kind of makes sense to envision them to look and work like a virtual machine but I think that's temporary. You know, they didn't mention this at uh, the briefing and on-site event, but I can definitely see a world where, you know, there will be something like CXT extensions, right? Some, some container technology, maybe even at the chip level, that would allow us to get some of the security boundaries we're looking for. But until then, I can kind of see this as a, you know, easy win to leverage existing technology to give people some of the things that they want today that are missing. Well, that, that was the major crossover for the uh, virtualization technology when it actually went onto the chip. And that seems like a pos possible then, you know, evolution we could see, you know, I'll be a very different with container uh, processes um, on the chip as well. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that's where the game change is going to actually happen. Um, I think, you know, from a performance pers perspective, I think containers have already given us that boost, mainly because we don't have to go through this virtualization layer. You kind of have raw access um, to underlying devices, file systems, CPU, and memory. 
Mm-hmm. But, you know, the big part that's missing here, though, is some of the insight. You know, if we can get better metrics from the overall system, we'll go a long way to improving the way we schedule these containers. So containers kind of go hand in hand with these cluster managers that really take advantage of the way um, people want to deploy containers, right? You want to basically treat the node as this abstract set of resources, put something on top. But the thing we put on top will need a little bit more visibility from the system. So this is where I think Intel will help a lot by being able to expose a lot of that telemetry data and then providing some security boundaries that we may not be able to do um, at the OS level. Hmm. Okay. So that brings into question then, you know, a lot of the other kind of moving pieces that you have here. Uh, you know, in particular, you talked about kind of like the more sophisticated hardware that we're seeing. And that more sophisticated hardware, for me, would be defined as just more software on the hardware. You know, and so my, my question is, 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 that, is that the tipping point for, for customers by being able to have that software capability on that hardware to abstract it more? So, you know, you can actually um, not have the manual configurations that you might have needed uh, before if you were trying to, you know, implement OpenStack maybe, you know, you know a few versions ago? Um, does this more sophisticated hardware play a role in this? So I think what the sophisticated hardware really does is even out the competition, right? It, gives, it evens the playing field a little bit here. You know, one reason why I think a lot of people hold on to uh, their hardware, and there's a lot of compliance and HIPAA, things like that. We always hear about the security angle, but there is still a real solid case around performance, right? Having raw access to SSDs and not sharing your hardware with anyone else um, has a lot of advantages. And that story gets even stronger when you start talking about Intel's 3D X-Point technology. You know, they're talking about in order of a magnitude performance increase over current SSDs, right? That's a game changer for for people looking to run in-memory databases. Um, Some of the challenges we typically had around designing system software, even distributed systems gain a lot from, you know, what Intel has coming down the pipe. So I think that's going to give people a little bit more of a reason to stay inside their own data centers and providing their own cloud-like environments. And it doesn't have to be, all virtual machines, right? It can be containers that just leverage these raw hardware resources underneath them. So now we see this, you know, more sophisticated hardware and the capabilities that provides. We see more, you know, kind of the the advent of containers in there and we're seeing their continued maturity. We're seeing, you know, what Intel is doing around clear containers and the possibility of, of containers almost being baked right into the chips themselves. We also have Kubernetes and, you know, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, and their interest in, in OpenStack. What, what, what do you think this does for OpenStack itself? And do, does it make it easier for customers to adopt their technology? So one thing I think, what we, I think this is a good opportunity for OpenStack when you think about it, right? OpenStack has never been open virtualization. It's never been open EC2, right? It's always been assumed that, okay, OpenStack would basically be a clone of what we thought a cloud point. But if you think about it, OpenStack has the opportunity to be much more than that. It can actually just be an open stack. And that stack will evolve over time. And right now, that seems to be trending towards this world of containers. And when you look at the OpenStack platform, there's a lot of tooling there around networking, which are mm-hmm. is something that you need in both worlds, whether it's virtual machines or containers. There's tooling around storage. Again, something you will share between Uh, both of those ways that you choose to carve up your infrastructure. So I think OpenStack itself has a lot of the primitives required for both worlds, but there's nothing stopping OpenStack from evolving and even diverging um, from Amazon EC2 in a way that um, will make it actually a little bit more viable, maybe even make it leapfrog in some ways what people have been doing by spinning up virtual machines, right? Developers don't really ask for an unconfigured operating system, right? That's the last thing you really want to deal with. You know, give me a virtual machine with a raw OS. That means I have to configure it. I really just want you to run my applications. And I think nothing is stopping OpenStack from being that platform 
to fulfill that promise. Hmm. Um, so it does open, it provide an opening for uh, OpenStack. Uh, maybe you could just help me sum it up and like you know, it was one or you know, one or two sentences if you could just think through like how you see perhaps then OpenStack evolving based upon that premise. I think OpenStack can evolve into a world where you have this like OpenStack controller that you point at your data center and what you end up with is a set of APIs for deploying your applications, right? That's what people want. I think on the flip side of OpenStack, if you're a cloud provider, then you may want OpenStack to be your EC2 clone, right? Where you have policy and a dashboard and you give out virtual machines and you have a way of billing people, right? That's, that's one way of looking at OpenStack. But I think the more important way to look at OpenStack and what its potential could be, I see the potential of OpenStack really making sure that they stay in tune to what the industry and their community wants to do, which is run applications over a set of hardware and make sure that they leverage those open source projects that jive well with that mission, which could be a world where we see something like Mesos and Marathon. It could be a world where we see it be Kubernetes and OpenStack adding value at the top and the bottom, right? OpenStack adds a lot of value in terms of getting machines to the point where they need to be, getting the network in the shape that it needs to be, and then offering value on top, such as the GUIs, dashboards, policies, and other things that will complement a system like Kubernetes well. Okay, so getting it uh, in a place um, where really uh, the, these companies who have this more sophisticated hardware, they have the capabilities to use containers more effectively. They can use this, you know, potentially uh, for being in line with uh, challenges that they face and creating scalable asset kind of infrastructure. That, that seems to be like the, the real sticking point when I talk to companies out there is like they don't have that scalable asset infrastructure and, that the open stack component is, I think has been challenging for some. There's been like companies like we're here to see Walmart where, you know, they have had, you know, they've had a thousand people working on open stack, right? You know, uh, but then you have other companies like, you know, American Express who are able to do it, you know, with just with a handful of people. The true issue is going to be coming down kind of the standardization almost of, you know, of that underlying infrastructure. And that's just that that still to me seems like a little bit of a ways off. I honestly think the biggest problem that OpenStack faces today is that it doesn't have its own identity, right? And that may be by design, but you know, it's one of the downfalls, right? Like if you start your your life as a clone of something else, it's very hard to I think capture the full vision of why AWS works the way it does, right? It could even come down to just people. And you don't necessarily have the standardization of only having to support really one platform, which is, you know, Amazon's cloud environment. Now you have to try to please in number of organizations. They want to do things a certain way. You have voting rights, boards, foundations. There's a lot of things that get in the way of just shipping software to a target market. So I think for OpenStack, the challenge will be, can OpenStack become convenient enough to use deliver on the original promise faster than it becomes a no brainer just to run into someone else's infrastructure, AKA the cloud. Mm -hmm. well, good. Um, th that's a pretty good summary of, uh, you know, where open tech is right now. Were there any other um, summary points that you came away thinking about uh, from, from that Intel, uh, you know, briefing? One big takeaway that I came away with, from the briefing was Intel is basically almost in this trifecta situation now. And the trifecta comes from they're producing a lot of the key hardware improvements that you're seeing, whether that's private cloud or in the public cloud, right? They're still in the business of providing hardware to most of the cloud providers, right? They dominate on most cloud providers. If you look at it, they're all running Intel uh, chips for the most part. So they have that world that they need to protect and continue to make better and follow Moore's law on the cloud side. 
But also on the private data center side, they're still doing things around Infiniband, uh, 3X Point, and there's a lot of other technology that they're bringing um, to the data center, whether that's networking all the way down to the server. So you'll start to see a complete play from Intel, even into the areas of storage. And then you see this other world where they're helping to influence the open source community on both fronts, whether that's from their investment arm into companies like maybe it's Cloudera, um, the work they're doing with Mesosphere. So there's these existing startups, whether they fund them, help them write code, help them advance their projects in the way that they become true um, equalizers to anyone that wants to provide cloud-like technologies. And then on the flip side, their projects like their TAP platform, which is their kind of big data um, offering that looks a lot like the Cloudera stack mm -hmm. or things like Clear Containers or even their Clear OS, which really shows the whole industry like, look, we're going to play nice and we're not here to compete with you, but we will show people how to leverage all of Intel's technologies in the best way possible. And to be honest, there's nothing stopping from picking that stuff up and make it a strong competitor to some of the open source projects that are currently leading the way. C current open source projects that are leading the way. What would you cite as some of those open source? For instance, like if you look at, if you look at core OS or project atomic or project photon from VMware, right? Those projects kind of are leading the way as terms of adoption um, from customers being able to purchase or get support for, an operating system that's tuned for containers, right? But on the flip side, if you look at Clear OS, which is Intel's entry into the Linux distro world, it's highly tuned for all of the advances in Intel's hardware and technology. So when you look at that as a blueprint on, look, this is how you squeeze the maximum amount of performance from Intel hardware, What's stopping people from looking at that and saying, you know what, that's where I want to be because I can care less about the operating system, whether it's Red Hat, Core OS, Canonical. I just look for max performance. And if Intel becomes the source of that, why not see adoption pick up in that area? That gets back to this discussion we've had before. Um, and one, I think one theme that we're going to look at more closely is these economic factors that uh, need to be considered now much more than ever before? In the in one of the last chapters in the ebook, it's a I wrote a story about this continuum. You know, the continuum from uh, virtualization to uh, to containers to serverless architectures. You know, and and beyond to the great unikernel in the sky, right? And this actually came out of a conversation that came with that service on Twitter. You know, that you were that you really initiated. And it seems like, you know, what, what, you know, writing this story, one of the kind of the conclusions I came down to is that the IT industry basically has been built on inefficiencies. And uh, those inefficiencies have, have created billions of dollars in wealth. Uh, and those inefficiencies come down to, you know, different kinds of hardware running different kinds of software, the need for interoperability across these different hardware and software, you know, systems and all the, all the complexities that, that provides, right? So we see so many, need, you know, solutions. We see, you know, we see the need for all, any, you know, a, a broad and deep tooling ecosystem. But now what we, we, it seems like what we're starting to see is um, this move towards performance. So where, uh, where before it was kind of this age of compatibility, now we're kind of shifting a little bit into this age of performance. And I think, Containers are a, that's why for me, containers are so symbolic. You know, they're more symbolic than, than anything else, but they're actually very real and pro provide a, you know, our, our core technology. And, 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 and you've touched on this too, but, you know, in your, your talk about kind of, you know, the scheduler technologies out there, right? And the ability uh, for schedulers to be quite dynamic and to be semantic almost in nature, uh, which if you can achieve that kind of semantic, you know, automation, so to speak, you do provide a new level of performance overall. It, it would, you know, I'm just curious here on your perspective on that. Yeah. So the way I look at it and the way, and one analogy I like to use is like the post office versus FedEx, right? 
you know, in the post office world, you can almost walk in there with anything and they're going to figure out a way to put a stamp on it and get it shipped somewhere. Right. I mean, they've improved over time, but if you look at like FedEx, you have to put it in a box, right? It needs to go in a box mainly because it allows them to build better processes and tools upstream, right? You bring it in the box, I put a label on it and I don't really care what's in that box. I just want to check its weight. It's resource requirements, right? Will be its weight, its size and its dimensions. And then we'll figure out the most effective way of getting it from point A to point B. And to me, I think containers do the exact same thing on the server side that FedEx was able to leverage, right? You give me a container and this is the contract, the developer and operations, the distributor of software, whether that's Oracle or someone giving you uh, their commercial product. Here's the container and this is a box. And this box has everything required to run what's inside of it. Mm -hmm. Don't concern yourself about Java, Ruby, Python, Go, who cares? That decision has already been made. At this point, it's simply time to run the application. Yeah. And now, once we have that contract, we're no longer talking about what OS do you want, what machine size do you want. That whole suite of offerings shrinks way down to here's how much it costs to run your container. Give me your container. We'll make sure that it runs enough copies of it to meet your requirements in the discussion. And that's a game changer. If it's just time to run the app, and it's not about the OS you want, um, you know, because you're not going to need those issues. You know, you're not going to have to deal with those kinds of problems. That seems to me like a, a, a scenario that encompasses OpenStack that requires this, you know, much more performant hardware in itself and almost, you know, the, the deconstruction of the open, OpenStack, you know, platform overall. I mean, it is considered an operating system in itself. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think the value that OpenStack can bring to this is, again, you know, I want to take OpenStack controller out I don't care if this is like a single node that you just kind of rack up in your data center. Right. And it should just turn all the other machines into usable compute units, right? Because there's still networking requirements. We do still need an OS, right? Like this isn't magic. So OpenStack's job could be to put just enough of the necessary parts in place so that I'm just left with an API to do exactly what we're talking about. Great. Well, Kelsey, thank you very much for taking some time, uh, you know, to talk before, uh, the week begins uh, in Amsterdam. Um, we'll uh, we'll follow up with you soon. We love having you on the show, and uh, you know it, it, it's great to get your perspectives here. They're very helpful. Awesome, man! Thank you again, Alex. Great. Thanks a lot.